And we are going to record this lecture and then we'll share it with you. So don't worry about it. And then I am muting all of you as you join. The reason is that the, with everyone start talking to each other, you know, there is some issue with the howling and so on. So I'm trying to do that myself. I'm sorry about it. However, if you have a question, you can leave the questions on the Zoom group, group chat or on Campus Wire so that the I can answer during the lecture or after the lecture. Does it, does it work with everyone? If you think so, then you, know, you can press the yes button on the Zoom chat as well. You see the yes button. So try to go to the participant, manage participant list, and then you'll see that they are yes or no, you know, like the, you see the button there, right? Yes, precisely, Kobe, yes. <laughs> okay, so let's see how many people we have. So we have 18 per students so far, so that's a good start. So does anybody know how many people there are taking lunch? I guess you know, we should wait just another three minutes. We'll start at 7.10. Not well, seven here, but it's like the one, ten, one there, right? Yes, one ten. Three more minutes. Okay, two more minutes, two more minutes. All right, we'll start in one minute. All right, so uh, welcome everyone to the course on natural language processing part two. So this is part two because we are going to talk more about the generation. So last week you learned from Edward about the how to do the text classification quite a bit, if I remember correctly, right? So instead, uh, today, uh, this week, we're going to learn about how to build a machine learning system that is able to generate a natural language text. And then natural language text generation is a fascinating topic because it has so many possible applications, including machine translation, as well as dialogue or the conversation model. So just before we start all these lectures, I'd like to point out a few things. Due to the COVID-19 situation, uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to travel to Rwanda nor my course assistant did. So everything is going to be remote, including the exams. So you'll be able to participate in this course fully remotely from your apartment using your laptop 
or your smartphone. And the main tool that we are going to use is the one that you are already using at the moment, that is a Zoom. The Zoom allows us to have a remote lecture as well as a remote lab session. And then every time we have the lab or the lecture, we have a Zoom meeting ID already created for on the Google Calendar. So if you have access to Google Calendar, then you'll see for each and every lab and the lecture sections, there is a Zoom ID created. All you need to do is click on it and then the Zoom starts and then me or one of our course assistant is going to be there to start the lab or lecture on time. And then unfortunately, because there will be many participants or many students, it's not going to be easy for us to uh, close caption. There's, there's clo so unfortunately the closed caption, we don't have the automated closed caption here, so, but everything is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch it again whenever you need. And then when you rewatch it, there won't be any issue with the network bandwidth or something like that. But in order to save bandwidth and also to leave the records and to minimize the disruption to the lecture, what we are going to do is we're going to ask you to ask questions on the Zoom chat or on Campus Wire then even if we cannot, I cannot answer it in real time, well, course, my course assistant as well as I will be answer later on, and then you can check the answer. So please do use Campus Wire as much as you can because in this kind of remote lecturing, the engagement is really difficult to keep up. However, we have to exploit this possibility of using internet as much as we can. So this is the link to the Campus Wire. I believe most of you have already created the account and joined the course page. However, if you have not done so, please do so as soon as possible. We are using Campus Wire in order to announce, make any kind of announcement or release any kind of important details for lab session as well as lectures. And furthermore, if you go to the chat room of the Campus Wire as shown in the slide, then I have already created several chat rooms according to the lab sessions as well as the lectures. So for instance, today, our lecture is on language modeling as well as a recap of the supervised learning. So if you go there, then you'll see that there is a chat room called lecture language modeling. You can leave any of the questions there. I won't be able to answer those questions during the lecture. However, after the lecture, during the break, I will go there and then trying to answer any questions you have as much as I can. And then over the, throughout this week, the course assistants as well as I will be on Campus Wire as much as we can so that we can answer your question as well. And we have three course assistants this week. Sriyas Mohan, I don't know if some of you remember, the tutors should remember, he was a course assistant last year, and then he was in Kigali and then helped me teach this course. So he'll be able to teach, again, help you and then knows a lot about what, uh, what you have gone through. So that's going to be very, very useful. Pumon Hood is my PhD student at NYU Center for Data Science. She has done a lot of interesting work on question answering as well as how to build a language model to induce the Latin structures. We're not going to talk about that that much, but if you have any question, you can always ask her directly. And the last course assistant is Sean Wellick. He is also a PhD student at NYU, but not at the Center for Data Science, but at the Computer Science Department. He is in fact a PhD student at the NYU Shanghai campus. He's spending this year at New York City, and then he will also be able to answer any questions that you have on Campus Wire as well as Zoom. So uh, the first part of today's two lectures, so to our lecture is the recap of supervised machine learning. So you've spent many months so far trying to learn what machine learning is. And then I heard that you've been doing amazingly well. So in order, but you know, it's always important to be reminded about what supervised machine learning is. And the supervised machine learning in fact works as the backbone or the foundation on which we can build all these language models and machine learning systems. 
So when we think about supervised learning, we are provided with the three things. The first one is the training examples. So training examples are the examples of the input and output that are correct. What does that mean for that to be correct? So what it means is that the, these are the examples that human have created. In our case, because it's very, very clear because language is for humans. So these are going to be all the examples that human have created. And the next, what we need is a per example loss function. What this loss function computes is that the given one input and then given the correct answer Y, how well does our machine or the machine learning model do? And then it's lower the better. So this is a per example loss function. And then in addition to these two, we need to have evaluation sets. And then these evaluation sets consist of validation set and test set. And then these validation and test sets are there to tell us what is, how well our machine does. And then he, given these three things, we must decide on two things. One is the hypothesis sets, and each hypothesis set corresponds to a set of all compatible models. And we're going to talk about this soon, and then we need to decide on the optimization algorithm that we're going to use. You're all familiar with this already. However, I'm just telling, we are recapping this because it's so important to be reminded of this, right? So let's say, we have already decided on the set of hypothesis sets and the optimization algorithms. Then supervised learning corresponds to finding an appropriate algorithm or model automatically. That is, within each hypothesis set, we want to find a machine that's going to minimize the average per example loss across the entire training set, right? So this is the entire training set. And then what, how we do that is we use the optimization algorithm. Now, this is called training. So why is it called training? Because we are going to train our machine within the hypothesis set using the training set. Now, training only allows us to find the best machine within hypothesis set, within each hypothesis set. So what we now need is to choose which hypothesis set is best. We have multiple hypotheses at H1, H2, all the way to HM, and then we have already trained the model, that is we found the best model within each of these machines, and then what we now need to do is we need to figure out using a validation set which hypothesis set or which model is going to be used, and then this is called model selection or validation. But both of them are effectively the same terms. Now, once we have found the best hypothesis set, that is the, among all those different model families, which model family is best, and then within that model family, which machine is best. So this M hat corresponds to the best machine from the hypothesis set. And then now we can, we need to tell people, other people that how well this model would work. Right? What do I mean by would work is that the, if I deploy this model, let's say face recognition model in the wild, or you know, like the, you're going to use the self-driving car. So you build a self-driving car and then you want to deploy it in the, on the street. So then how well will it work? In order to do that, that's when we use the test set. So we're going to look at how well this machine works on the test set. And then that's going to be what we are going to report to our managers, our clients, or just people in general. And then now at the end of the day, what we end up with is the algorithm M head. So we end up with an algorithm M head with the expected performance of the R, the test set loss R of M head. So this is the basic idea behind the supervised learning. It's a very, very high level overview, right? So we're going to go into slightly more detail. Oops. 
Okay, so in order to do the supervised learning, we need three things to do. First thing, we need to decide what this hypothesis set is. I just talked about hypothesis set over and over. And the hypothesis set in our case is going to be neural network. Of course, before neural network, there are a lot of different hypotheses that we had to consider, such as the support vector machines, naive base classifier, logistic regression, and so on. In the case of the classification, in the case of regression, linear regression and Gaussian processes are the kind of main thing. And then for each of the machine learning model class, we have, we, we have a separate hypothesis set for every possible hyperparameter setting. So for support vector machines, in the, case, in the case of support vector machines, every time we change this regularization constant to be a certain value, we create a new hypothesis set. Now, here in this course, we're going to only talk about neural networks. And then in neural networks, the architecture of the network defines a hypothesis at H. And then for each architecture contains both the how the network looks like, right? Such as the AlexNet or the Google Net, but also the hyperparameters. For instance, how large is this network is one hyperparameter. How do we initialize the weight values is another hyperparameter. What kind of weight decay coefficients we are going to have is the hyperparameter. So every time we define a experimental setup that corresponds to creating a new hypothesis set. And then once we have such a hypothesis set, we have infinitely many models within this hypothesis set because every single parameter set it, setup corresponds to one model, right? What it means is that the, we change just a little in the parameters of this network, then the whole thing changes. So there are infinitely many of them. And then now our goal with learning or training is to find a good model from this hypothesis set. And the, our goal is not to find the best model because that's impossible in general. What we want is to find a good model from the hypothesis. Now, then we need to talk a bit about the network architecture. What do we mean by network architecture? Important thing to notice is that the, any neural network is an arbitrary directed acyclic graph. So it is directed because all these edges are directed. So there is a direction of the signal going from one box to another box. And it's acyclic because there's no cycle in this graph. So without cycle, what it means is that if we start from some of the nodes, we start following the edges, we never come back to the node, the same node again. And then it's a graph in the sense that there, there are nodes and edges and then they are connected. And then in the first part of this lecture, especially today, we are going to use a particular notation where the solid circles, solid circles correspond to parameters that are to be estimated or found by training and dash circles correspond to vector inputs and outputs. And the input and outputs are not the things that we change. They are the ones that are given to us as a form of a training example, validation example, or test example. And then we have a square that corresponds to the compute node. So these are functions that takes as input multiple vectors and then trying to output yet another vector or scalar. And then these functions, we intentionally choose them to be continuous and differentiable, although that's not absolutely necessary. So in this case, we can now think about you know, how does this work with the, some existing machine learning models that you have already learned? You have learned the logistic regression already quite some time ago. And in the case of the logistic regression, our input is X, that is some kind of vector, right? So it's often the RD dimensional vector. And then the model or the logistic regression is identified by these two parameters, right? Weight and bias. 
And then once we have that, what it computes is that it computes the dot product between weight vector and the input vector. And then you add the bias scalar and you feed it through the sigmoid function. And then this whole process can be written down as a directed acyclic graph where we had the input x and then we had the parameters w and v. And then the first computation node is a dot product node. And then this dot product node takes as the input x and w and then outputs a single scalar. And then that is fed together with the bias into the next computational node that is simply the computing the plus or the sum of them. And then after that, we have the final computational node that is sigmoid function. And then you can always think about trying to write down any machine learning system or the supervised machine learning system into this kind of directed acyclic graph. Uh, let me see. So there is a message on the Zoom saying that, the, okay, could I please tilt your camera a bit little closer to me? Okay, let's see. Let me see. Okay. Yes, uh, I can definitely do that. So, okay. So is this better for you? Can you use the yes, no button on the Zoom to tell me if this, this is better? Okay, I get one S. Yes, two yeses. Okay, so all right, great. So I'm going to keep it like this, okay? Hopefully this is better. And then there is a question. Um, yes, so in the side, the question is that where is the output? So the output is going to be the output from the final computational node always. So because it's a directed acyclic graphs, there is no cycle. What we can do is we can do so-called topological sweep of the graph. We start from the nodes that have no incoming edges, and then we're going to do the breadth first sweep. So given these inputs, we're going to compute this first, and then next, and then next, and then we have always the final nodes that do not have any outgoing edges. And then the, co the computational outputs from those nodes are the output of this graph. And also, you could think about making a cyclic graph. However, cyclic graph is a bit problematic because theoretically saying, there's no way for us to actually stop the computation. It's going to just continue on and on. Of course, we could think about having some kind of conditional statements such as if, however, but that's not really desirable. So now this is a computation part. So when we say forward computation, that's what we do with the, when we want to use a trained neural network. So somebody trained a neural network, we're going to follow the topological order or the breadth first search, starting from the nodes that do not have the input or the incoming edges, and most of them are either parameters or the input variables. And then we're going to go one step at a time until the computation is done. In the case of logistic regression, we can look at this kind of animation. So we start from the X, the input, W and B, both of which are parameters. We first compute the dot product between X and W. We sum the outcome, output of this dot product with the bias, and then the output of this summation is going to be, go, be an input to the sigmoid function. And the sigmoid function's output is precisely what this logistic regression computes. That is the probability of input belonging to the positive class. Now, what it means is that the, any directed acyclic graph we create, creates a hypothesis set. And then the, it's really nice, this abstraction of the neural net into the directed acyclic graph, because it naturally supports a high level abstraction. And then it fits the objective, object oriented paradigm pretty well, because all we need to do is we need to compute the base classes that are variable nodes or the operation node, where the operation nodes corresponds to computa actual computation, right? And then what we need to do is we just define internal, uh, the various types of the vari variables and operations by using the idea of inheritance. And then this allows us to maximally reuse the code. And then you already know what it means, right? 
because you've learned how to use the TensorFlow and then maybe a bit of PyTorch and then some other libraries. And then there, you didn't have to know much about the actual details of how these were implemented, but you could actually build all these neural nets at the level of abstraction that allows you to simply focus on how to build this directed ASA quick graph. And then you're going to look into how to use this level of abstraction to build language model and machine translation system throughout this semester, uh, this course, this week, yes. So, okay, now we know how to set the hypothesis set or define the hypothesis set. Now then how do we decide a loss function? As you may have learned, there are so many ways to define a loss function, but in this course, so this week, we're going to stick to a very straightforward so-called distribution-based loss function. So, okay, there is the question. Let's answer the question first. If the graph network is too big, it will be difficult to learn, right? For example, by using breadth first. So the breadth first is just computation. And then even if the graph is really, really large, if you design this graph in a way that is easily parallelizable, the multiple computations, then breadth first doesn't really matter because all those computations that are at the same level can be computed in parallel. So that shouldn't really matter that much. And then we're going to look at a very, very large network throughout this week. Uh, so you, you'll notice that. So back to the, our loss function. So we're going to stick to the distribution-based loss function. And then what do I mean by the distribution-based loss function? So in original supervised learning, we thought our goal was to compute or the estimate this function. That is, what is the output y given x? However, what we actually want to do, because there is the uncertainty in the answer, is to compute how probable, how probable a certain value of y is given x. And then that is just computing the conditional probability of certain possible output given the input. And then there are many different distributions we can use, but we are going to focus mainly on the categorical distribution, where categorical distribution is defined over many possible values to which the input belongs. So this is for multi-class classification. And then you will notice soon that the, it's all about multi-class class, natural language generation is all about multi-class classification. So what is this categorical distribution? Let's look at a bit of math, you know. So what we want to compute is that the given x, so given x, what is the probability of y prime? There are many possible y primes, and then if there is a one y prime, what is the probability of that value given the input? And then in the case of the multi-class classification, categorical distribution is used, and then this categorical distribution is defined over C many values, that is one, two, C. So we're going to say there are C many classes to which the input could belong to. And this categorical distribution computes the probability by simply carrying over all those probabilities, mu one, mu two, and mu C. Of course, they have to sum to one because they have to be probabilities, and then they are non-negative. And often it's really easy to build a neural network that's going to output the categorical distribution. How do we do that? We're going to have the input as usual. We're going to have some set of parameters. So theta is going to be used to denote set of parameters of a directed acyclic graph here, right? So, and then we can have some arbitrary subgraphs. So it could be logistic regression like thing or neural net or Google net or whatnot. And then this network is going to output a vector, real valid vector of C dimension. And then the C dimensional vector can, which I'm going to use A here, can be go into the softmax function to, so that it's going to end up being a categorical distribution, mu one, mu two to mu C. And then what this softmax distribution does is to first, we exponentiate all the values so that they're going to be positive Right, so if you exponentiate any, any value, it's going to be a positive. And then we divide 
each and every exponentiated value with the sum of the exponentiated value. And then by doing so, the sum of the resulting vector elements, that is mu1, mu2 to mu c is going to be one. And then because it's a distribution, the probabilities have to sum to one, right? So we're, we're going, let's skip the Gaussian distribution because we're not actually going to use Gaussian distribution in this course. So once we build a neural net to output a conditional distribution, that is P, P of Y given X. So it's a P of Y given X. And then I'm going to use theta here because this theta identifies how this distribution is computed. So let me see. So there is a question. Is it possible for a mu to be equal to zero if it is what is the interpretation? Yes. So let's come back here. So the mu can very well be zero. So mu, all these mu's need to be non-negative. That is uh, non-negative. That is, it could be positive or zero. And then as long as they sum to one. Now, what does it mean for one of the mu's to be zero? Is that the, the probability, the chance that the input x is going to result in the class C of the probability zero never happens. So that's never going to happen. However, one thing to note is that because we use a softmax function ourselves, the probabilities are always going to be strictly positive unless we have the infinitely large value of A, which never happens in our case. So once we have built this kind of neural network that computes a conditional distribution, a very natural way to define a loss function is to simply define it as the negative log probability. So why negative log probability? Because what we want is that the under this distribution of our neural network, the probability of the correct answer, and the why is it correct answer? Correct answer because it's from the training example. Because as I said earlier, training example is the one that humans get provided. So we take that as the correct answer. And then what we do is we want our machine P of theta to assign as high probability to this correct label given the input. And then that is what we call maximum likelihood learning because we want to maximize how likely the correct answer is given the input. And then of course, maximizing something is identical or equivalent to minimizing the negation of that. So that's how we end up with the negative log probability as our loss function. So our loss function is going to be negative log probability of the correct answer given the input. And then we're going to sum them over the training instances and then that's the objective function that we're going to minimize using an optimization algorithm to find our machine theta. And then the interesting thing is that the, as long as your neural network outputted a distribution in a soft way using a softmax function, this whole negative log probability is also a differentiable computation. What it means is that the, this is simply going to be one of those computational nodes in a directed acyclic graph. So in the case of PyTorch, you're going to use, for instance, NLL loss. What it means is that the even loss function becomes a part of the directed acyclic graph, and then choosing different types of loss function corresponds to having different hypothesis sets. However, in our case, we just stick to this negative log probability throughout the entire uh, course. So let's go back to this example of the logistic regression. Our logistic regression classifier computed the conditional probability of X belonging to the positive class. Now then what we do is we're going to now add in this negative log probability as another computational node and then this negative log probability takes as input the output from the logistic regression and also 
What is it? The actual correct answer. So then, given the correct y and the output from the logistic regression classifier, this NLL loss is going to compute the negative log probability assigned by our, our machine, that is a logistic regression, to the correct y from the training example. And then now we can just do the forward computation as usual, right? So how will we do the forward computation? We're going to do the forward computation by for starting from y, x, and w, right? So these are the nodes that do not have any incoming edges. Now we do the breadth first search. So next one is going to be dot product. And the next one is going to be this summation. Next one is going to be this sigmoid. And then finally it's going to compute the negative log probability. That is the NLL loss. So this all makes sense in a sense that the, all we do is to build a directed acyclic graph. Now we have decided on the hypothesis that we have now decided on the loss function to be the negative log probability. Now we need to know how to optimize the loss function with respect to or the with respect to the our machine that is the parameters of the machine in your network. So what we are going to do is throughout this course, we're going to assume that the everything is continuous and differentiable. Now input doesn't have to be continuous nor differentiable. However, anything else that has been computed is going to be continuous and differentiable. So what it means is that we start from some input and then we end up with some scalar value that is going to be, and then with respect to that one, we can actually compute the derivative of everything. And then in order to do so, what we need to know is, given the current parameters theta zero, what should I do in order to minimize this loss functional? And then to do that, we're going to rely on gradient descent. And then what we do is we compute the gradient of the loss at the current point but then we take the negative direction because the gradient computes what is the slope, right? And then what we want to do is that we want to follow slope in the opposite direction in order to lower the actual value. So, and, but of course, this gradient is only valid in a very small neighborhood nearby. So we're going to take a very small step using a so-called learning rate or the step size. And it's possible, of course, to, let's say, come up with a better learning algorithm. However, the neural net that we're going to build is are really, really huge. Has the millions, if not billions of the parameters. And in that kind of high dimensional space, it's very difficult to use this second order information. So we're going to strictly stick to this stochastic gradient descent algorithm. So this is a very simple illustration. The x-axis is going to my, my theta y-axis corresponds to my loss. And then we're going to start from some arbitrary point. And then we follow the gradient. And then we move toward left because that's where the next nearby minimum is. And then eventually we end up in the minimum, local minimum. It doesn't have to be the best minimum. There are many different minimum. And then depending on where you start, you might end up here or there. But that's fine in this kind of high dimensional space with the parametrization that we use for this neural network, it turned out that it's all fine to use whatever kind of, let's say, minimum that we end up with. All right, so let's see. So now once we, so how do we compute this gradient? That's a big question. And then that's where the back propagation comes in. You have all learned backpropagation already in the earlier ones, right? Ah, so before we go into the backpropagation, there is a question about how we choose the starting point. So how we choose the starting point turned out to be not that easy. However, you may have heard about the Kai Mingho initialization or Xavier Glorod initialization. So those initialization methods are very, very powerful in a sense that the, they tend to find the point in the parameter space that in fact, uh, find the good local minimum. 
So you are going to look into how parameters are initialized over the left sessions, uh, you know, probably later today and tomorrow and even on Wednesday as well. That should be fine. So how many of you have learned about backpropagation? Let's use the Zoom yes, no to see you know, like the, how many have you have learned. So if you have learned about backpropagation and are familiar with the concept, let's press yes here. Okay, there's yeses coming up, yes. All right, perfect. So Ami has been teaching you very, very well. So backpropagation is one of the most fundamental concepts in machine learning and then perhaps the, one of the most important concept there. So we're going to quickly go over it because you have learned it and then this backpropagation corresponds to backward computation in directed acyclic graph. And then what backpropagation does is to compute the derivatives or the gradients automatically. So we call it automatic differentiation or sometimes to be more specific, this is a reverse mode of it. So reverse mode automatic differentiation because of course you can do the different differentiation as you go. That is in the forward case, that is a um, forward mode uh, automatic differentiation. However, that's pretty expensive memory, right? So we're going to stick to the reverse mode automatic differentiation. And then the fundamental idea behind automatic differentiation is a chain rule of derivative as you all know. And then what you notice is that the, what chain rule of derivative tells you is that the, if I had a two comp computational node or two functions and I want to compute the derivative of the this composite of these two functions with respect to the input all I need to do is to compute the derivative of the second function with respect to the first function and then multiply that with the derivative of the first function with respect to the input what it means is that this corresponds to having x as the input, right? And then this goes into computational node g, and then this goes into computational node f. And then what I do is that the, I, I need to know how to compute the derivative. So oops, let me just use the eraser to delete this one, okay? So what I want to do is that the, I want to compute the gradient or the derivative or Jacobian of this F with respect to the input. And then I'm going to multiply that with the Jacobian of the G with respect to the input there. And then I end up with computing the Jacobian of the whole thing, right? And then what it means is that the all I need to know is how to compute this quantity that is the Jacobian vector product. Okay, there is a question. In backpropagation, we're going backwards since our graph is directed. How are we computing gradient backward? And this slide is precisely the slide that is explaining that one. That is, we, are all, we need to compute for each and every computational node a backward function that computes this Jacobian vector product. So what do I mean by Jacobian vector product? So this F is the function of the computational node and then this function computes, takes as the input d dimensional x and then outputs the d prime dimensional vector. So this f took as the input d dimensional vector and then outputs a d prime dimensional vector. What it means is that the Jacobian here, Jacobian of f should take as the input the d prime dimensional vector and then outputs the d dimensional vector where the input is going to be the gradient of the final thing be, uh, from the all the future computations that's going to be the this part and then what is what should be output is now if i compute the product of this jacobian and the future gradient what should the gradient that's going to be forwarded backward, propagated backward. So that's why it's called back propagation. And this is also why we call it backward computation. So just graph, if you look at the graphical illustration, 
we computed the negative log likelihood loss. And then from there on, we're going to pass this gradient backward, following the exactly the same order that was used in the forward computation, except in its reverse. Then we'll be able to compute the gradient of this NLL loss or the loss function that we have decided to use with respect to W, the weight vector, and the bias. Now, the really amazing thing is that the, because we've been using this abstraction of the directed acyclic graph, right? So we've been using directed acyclic graph, and then we are using this automatic differentiation, and then this automatic differentiation can be implemented per node individually and then can be reused over and over. What it means is that the, again, all we need to do is just build this directed acyclic graph, and then this underlying framework can handle all these, let's say, distributed computation or GPU computation or CPU computation on its own. It's just like programming in general. When you use Python, you really don't care much about how CPU is designed or constructed how memory is specifically designed or constructed. You just work in the Python land where everything, all those details have been abstracted out, right? So this turned out to be a great thing for us in general. And once we, we know how to compute this gradient, we can now use so-called stochastic gradient decenter algorithm where instead of using the entire training set, which can be really, really large, we are going to only use a small random subset of training examples to compute this so-called mini batch gradient. Once we have this mini batch gradient, then what we can do is we can simply consider this as the full batch or the full gradient that we need to follow. And then we're going to say, oh, this is all fine. We're going to simply use this. So, and then this becomes a stochastic gradient descent. This is actually great. This is unbiased estimate. Only thing we need to be careful about is that the learning rate has to be selected to be small and then has to decrease over time as you train. And then at the end of the day, this is the de facto standard practice in machine learning or deep learning. And then the one, so before we finalize this part and take some break, there is an important concept of always stopping. You already learned about always stopping, but because it's so important, I'm going to repeat it once more. You can visualize how learning happens by thinking about this kind of hypothesis space or set where every point corresponds to one model, right? And then what we are doing is that at every point, we're going to compute the gradient and then follow the gradient to find the point with a very low loss function. And then let's say in this particular case, the actual, the minimum of the training example was this theta tilde. However, we don't want to use theta tilde because what we want is not that one. We want to find the machine that has the minimum validation loss function. So what we do is you're going to run the optimization all the way and then while saving once a while these checkpoints. And then once you have the checkpoints, now you can see which checkpoint had the lowest validation loss, and then you use that one. And that's called only stopping. So what this means is that the all, with the only stopping, you don't actually stop. You just train a model as long as you can, and then you backtrack and then check all those intermediate checkpoints to find the one that has the lowest validation loss or the highest validation accuracy. And then this turned out to be really important because our networks are really, really large and then they can easily overfit or memorize all the training examples. So we don't want to get into the situation. So there's a question from Francis. So at what stage does the DAC become bidirectional or undirected for the back propagation to take place? So the Directed acyclic graph is never bidirectional nor undirected. It is just a directed acyclic graph. It's only that the back propagation use simply flips all those edges, the direction of the edges in order to 
go backward in time in order to compute all those gradients. Next question. Why do we do stochastic GD and why and how is it better than GD? So we do the stochastic gradient descent because, when, because the training set is too large. In order to compute the gradient, we have to go through every single example in a batch of training instances. If our training set is too large, it's too expensive to compute this mini batch, uh, this gradient. That's why we use the stochastic gradient descent where we use a random subset of training examples each time. Of course, we change the random subset every time. Oops. So now we have learned how to do supervised learning or we have reviewed because you already know because Ami has been teaching you well how to do supervised learning with the neural network. So that's great. And then now we're going to go into the language model. But before we go into the language model, we're going to take 10 minutes of break. So please come back by 8.05. 8 and then I'm going to switch to the next Zoom link for that one, okay? In order to make sure that the recording happens well. So we're going to talk about the unbiased estimate of the gradient uh, later because that's not really important. What it means is that the stochastic gradient descent works, should work as well as the gradient descent. So this is the new Zoom link. Then I'll talk to you later then. All right, five minutes. All right, I'll see you in 8.06.